Hi, I'm Paul Wells. I listen to a lot of piano covers on YouTube. If someone has gone to all the trouble of learning a song and recording their own version of it, then they most likely have a passionate connection with that song. But I do hear a lot of recurring mistakes, which would be easy to fix. So here are my top six piano cover video mistakes. But first, if you'd like to be notified as I make new videos, then please subscribe to my channel and click the bell notification icon. Recording without direct injection. So here we go. No direct injection. An hotel being built next door. Milton Keynes traffic spilling in through an open window. bus driving by. To explain, direct injection means recording through wires from your instrument to whatever you are using to make the recording, usually a computer these days. With direct injection, the recorded audio excludes ambient sounds of all kinds, such as the clatter of the keyboard. You might need to buy a couple of adapters to connect everything together. You might even need to buy an analog to USB digital converter if your computer has no microphone input. I'm guilty of not using direct injection on some of my early tutorial videos, but that was because I needed to speak as well as play, and I didn't have any other way to record everything. Without direct injection, not only do you introduce unwanted background sound, there is also a loss in sound quality. Without direct injection, the final recording has been through an amplifier, a loudspeaker, and then a microphone, each stage of which diminishes the sound quality in turn. The solution? Buy whatever adapters and digitizers you need in order to get a clean recording. For example, I use this Yamaha MG10XU. I use channel one for the microphone, which I'm using right now. I use channels 5 and 6 for the stereo output of the Nord and channels 7 and 8 for the output of the Roland Integra which I mainly use for the bass sound on all of the recordings that I make. Before this mixer I used to use a Newmark analog to digital converter which I used to convert the analog output of the piano to USB and then record straight into the computer. This didn't cost much and generated a fairly good strong digital signal with very little noise. Number two, using the out of the box ambience. Using the out of the box ambience makes digital pianos sound cramped, stuffy and artificial. And I can explain why. Roland, Yamaha, Nord, Korg, Kawai, or whoever built your keyboard in their factory didn't know what you were going to plug your keyboard into. You might have your keyboard plugged into a standalone keyboard amplifier on stage, in which case you will want very little reverb because the room you are in will have its own natural reverb. You might have your keyboard plugged into a mixing desk in which case the sound engineer will want complete control to set the ambience of your instrument. Ambience, or wetness as it's often called, can be added to the sound, but once it's been added, it cannot be removed. So in this case, you want a totally dry sound from your keyboard. Alternatively, you might be using your keyboard in a recording studio, in which case, again, you won't want any ambience generated by the keyboard because the sound engineer will want to record the dry sound and will add ambience to the sound later when the track is mixed. Or you may be practicing your playing on your own and listening through your headphones, in which case you will actually want quite a lot of reverb to give you a satisfying sound. You will want the keyboard to generate that for you. So given all of these different possible situations, the factory have to take a wild guess at where to set the out-of-the-box level of ambience. Typically, they just give their instrument a hint of reverb. The end result is 
if you record your cover using the default ambience with direct injection, then you get that claustrophobic digital piano sound. The solution, tailor the ambience which you use on the assumption that your audience is listening using headphones. Try different ambiences to find what best suits the song. A slow song will be enhanced by a long, bright ambience. A fast-paced song will benefit from a big but rapidly decaying ambience. So, to pick some examples, Waterloo. There is a fast song, and I don't want echo and reverb hanging around, blurring the chord changes. However, for my sweet lord, the chord changes are more gentle, and I want a cathedral-like ambience to give it a more spiritual sound. The other tip about use of ambience, if at all possible, apply all of the ambience to the top half of the keyboard and leave the left hand dry. So with my setup, I give the Nord a lot of reverb, but I give the Roland no reverb. Number three, playing over the original track. You would think this is an obvious massive fail, but you do sometimes still hear examples of it. I think it's just about forgivable for a solo instrumentalist to play over the original soundtrack. Even then, I'd rather just hear your flute, your drums, your voice or your bass in isolation. I recently hired a couple of singers from the website Fiverr. For anyone unfamiliar with Fiverr, Fiverr is a marketplace for a range of skills but seems to host a disproportionately large number of musicians. Each singer on Fiverr has a 60 second reel which plays if you hover your mouse over their profile. Obviously, I'm looking to choose someone with the skill and character in their voice to make my song work best. And so I want to hear their solo, untreated voice. Unfortunately, most singers on Fiverr showcase a full soundtrack with their own voice, the bit I'm actually interested in, buried deep in the mix. I believe that Pop Idol, American Idol, The X Factor are exactly right to force contestants to audition to come on the programme without backing tracks, without amplification, without effects. Contestants just stand and sing in the interview room. Well, anyway, back to piano covers. Playing over the backing track, the whole point of a piano, as different from nearly all other musical instruments, is it spans a large number of octaves and is polyphonic, meaning lets you play lots of notes at the same time. Piano is also a percussion instrument, so you can build rhythm into your performance. You effectively have your own orchestra at your fingertips. So why would you want to play over the original studio mix track? The solution, by all means, learn the song by playing over the original track. I can play any YouTube video on my computer and listen through track nine alongside my own playing. This makes it easy to learn new songs. However, you eventually need to cut loose from the original track. The point is not to be afraid to record your own sparse version. Your audience won't think it sounds sparse. They'll accept it for what it is. Be aware that many people would actually even prefer to hear the piano part in isolation. Without the backing track, you will find that your playing starts to cover the spaces in the sound and you won't be fighting for position in the sound. The space is now all yours to fill. Number four, broken chords. A broken chord is a chord played with its notes fired separately rather than simultaneously. The music score notation for a broken chord is a vertical squiggly line. When you first discover this type of embellishment, it really is tempting to use broken chords far too much. I know I did in my early years. The problem is that dropping broken chords in at random places in the song adds a rather insipid, inexact pianoiness to the whole sound. Broken chords are like a loose, non-committal handshake. The solution? Believe in the power of unbroken chords. The result is a much more positive experience for the listener. 
It sounds a lot more like you know what you're doing if you hit each chord full on and leave broken chords out of it. Broken chords are useful for when you want to just put the icing on the cake. Number five, varying the speed by difficulty. This is like a little car that slows down every time it has to climb a steep hill. For some classical pieces, it's expected that you're going to want to add emotion by varying the tempo. You don't want to squander the good harmony by skipping over it too quickly. But nobody's dancing to classical music. It's not expected to be played at a regular tempo. However, modern music is expected to be played at a fixed tempo. For example, with Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing, I added a pause before the last verse. By adding a pause, you are effectively saying to your audience, let's start this song up again. It works, it's a great effect, but if you use it too often, then it rapidly becomes annoying. But worse still, is if you're the only reason that you're actually slowing down is because there's a tricky bit coming up. In this case, you're trying to pass off this speed reduction as being extra emotion when it, in fact you're just giving yourself a bit more time to tackle what's coming next. So the solution is to prevent the need to slow down for those tricky passages by focusing your practice on those passages so that you can deliver those bits without slowing them down. For fixing variations in speed, you need a metronome. It feels horrible, but when you switch the metronome off, you'll find that your internal clock has been strengthened. Number six, boring bass lines. A boring bass line is a bass line which just pumps out the root notes. I believe that upright pianos are to blame for this common piano cover shortcoming because they produce a sound which contains very little of the fundamental frequencies of the pitches below about one octave below middle C. I'm talking about the real bass, not just the harmonics of the note. This deficiency of true bass encourages the piano player to play in octaves to try and balance out the sound. In turn, playing in octave constricts your ability to play a more interesting bass line as you can only bounce your whole left arm around. You forfeit the finer control that you can get over the bass line if you use all of your fingers. I grew up playing exclusively upright pianos and it formed a habit I've never really been able to shake off. The solution, well, you've got to get more bass into the balance of the sound your piano is producing. If you're playing an acoustic piano, which is positioned up against a wall, try pulling it away from the wall so you can hear a reflection from the bass strings. If you are recording an upright piano, you'll need to position the microphone close to the bass strings. If you're using a digital piano, then you'll have to equalize the sound to include a bias towards the bass. If you can, get another sound source to generate the bass and split your keyboard to only send notes to the bass below middle C. This way, with a better bass response, however you achieve it, you'll be able to relax and let your left hand express itself without being occupied with bashing out octaves. When your left hand has more sound at its command, you'll find that your style shifts to use inversions a lot more. So those were my six YouTube piano cover mistakes and how to avoid them. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, then please click the like button. I also enjoy reading comments, so please message me and I will reply. And remember, the most important thing about music is what it sounds like.